the boat would bring in these patients who were ill, they would bring them up and we would have to take them into this room and wash their hair. And some of them had never seen a bathtub and they were afraid to get in the water. I remember crying. My mother would had to push me to go there with this nurse. That day must have been about three, four ships. Must have been about five, six thousand people. Damn, I remember it was August. Hot as a pistol. And I'm wearing my long johns on a heavy Irish tweed suit. I'm dying with the heat. So you're not concerned. You don't realize that this is history in the making. You're just in there. You want to get in and get the hell out of there and, and get off, you understand? They got her off the boat. And then they walked in, in a parade, to up those stairs into the building. Many of them came through with all their bedding and their last possessions, you know, that they own. They looked pretty bad. These buildings were filled with people who were desperate, whether from hunger, discrimination they, they didn't leave where they came from because life was so good for them it wasn't whatever they had here was better and that's what I feel now I feel these people all around me so desperate to cross this little body of water. A century ago, in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty, one of the world's great public hospitals was built. The hospital was America's first line of defense against contagious disease. It was here that the germs of the world converged. Malaria and typhus from the tropics, cholera from the Mediterranean, hookworm from the rice paddies of Canton, favus and trachoma from Central and Eastern Europe. The Ellis Island Hospital was massive. 22 buildings crammed onto two small islands, man-made from rock and dirt, excavated while building New York's subway system. The hospital was where America's conflicting beliefs about immigration collided, at once welcoming and threatening. Those judged healthy enough to work were allowed entry to America. Those thought incurable, insane, or weak were deported. Let no one believe that landing on the shores is a pleasant experience. It is a hard, harsh fact, surrounded by the grinding machinery of the law, which shifts, picks, and chooses admitting the fit and excluding the weak and hopeless. Edward Steiner, On the Trail of the Immigrant. Of the 12 million who came through Ellis Island, tens of thousands of immigrants failed the mandatory medical inspection and were detained at the hospital. The hospital could be an overwhelming place. The language, the food, the customs, and even the care were strange to many of the immigrant patients. 350 babies were born in the hospital. Many of these instant citizens were named after the doctors and nurses who delivered them. 3,500 immigrants died in the Ellis Island Hospital. 
For most of the others, the hospital marked the beginning of their new life in a new country. Americans, on the one hand, wanted immigrants to come. On the other hand, when they came, and they came in droves, Americans were very concerned uh, and very, very ambivalent in their feelings toward these newcomers. The medical inspection was directed at the immigrants who traveled second or third class. The wealthier first-class passengers received little more than a glance from public health physicians. For these immigrants, citizenship was nearly automatic. For the others, the medical inspection stood between them and a life in America. I think, frankly, the worst memory I have of Ellis Island was the physical. The doctors were seated at a long table with a basin full of potassium chloride. You had to stand in front of them, and you had to reveal yourself. They gave you what we used to, in the Army, they call short arm inspection, right there in front of everyone. And we went to this big, like an open room, and there were a couple of doctors there, and then they tell you to strip. And my mother had never, ever undressed in front of us. You know, in those days, nobody ever would. Every immigrant who came to Ellis Island had to climb the large staircase that led to the Great Hall. At the top of the staircase, stood uniformed public health service doctors who watched intently for signs of heart trouble, breathing difficulty, any kind of disability. It was the first test of the immigrants' fitness to become the laborers America was seeking. As many as 6,000 immigrants a day were herded past the dozen doctors working the line. The doctors had less than 30 seconds to judge whether an immigrant required a more thorough medical exam. One in five immigrants received a chalk mark indicating a suspected condition. That mark could mean separation from family, an involuntary stay at the hospital, and even deportation. Ours would be the painful duty of singling out one of the children and of saying, she has trachoma, she cannot enter. The mother and the rest of the children would have to return to Europe with the diseased one. And until the boat sailed, the father, wretched and unhappy, would haunt the detention quarters while his family kept up a constant wailing and crying. Dr. Victor Heiser, United States Public Health Service. The Ellis Island Hospital was known as the Hospital of All Nations. In 1914, when the hospital was fully operational, 10,000 patients from 75 different countries walked, hobbled, or were wheeled on gurneys or in wheelchairs through the hospital's double doors. Uh, we had Greece, Armenians, uh, we had a lot of Germans, and we had a lot from uh, Jewish people, and uh, Irish, a lot of Irish came over, and England. We had a mixture of, of every, a little bit of everything. Many of the patients arrived with little more than the clothes on their backs. Their ignorance of medical procedures, like the recently invented X-ray, made the hospital a harrowing place. Basha is a Polish woman. She had not the slightest idea what an X-ray meant and thought police wanted her photograph. I am not a bad woman, she said, and I won't have my photograph taken with no clothes on. Red Cross narrative report. 
It was the young children for whom the hospital could be the most frightening. Separated from their parents and often unable to understand what the staff was saying, they felt abandoned. John Gacquer, who was hospitalized with diphtheria upon arriving from France, returned to the hospital 70 years later. I was five uh, and uh, about five months old. Uh, having been born in Paris, I only spoke French. And everything around me was a big uh, muddle because I didn't understand the, what was going on or even what language was being spoken. I was not sick. There was nothing ailing or you know uh, bad with me. It was just, uh, I guess, under uh, observation. They took me away from my mother. I didn't know what was happening. She didn't know what was happening, and I was here in this place away from her, never knowing if I was going to see her again. Well, I was there five days before they decided that. It was nothing contagious, that it was just a sore throat that had passed. And uh, by the end of that time, I was used to the routine, but I still missed my parents and thought they had gone on without me. I was in the children's ward, all those beds in a huge room, and I tried so hard to, ask, to find out how long I would have to be there, and what was wrong with me. I just wanted to talk, and they couldn't understand me. They couldn't speak German, and I couldn't speak English. Over 300 nurses, attendants, ward matrons, and orderlies staffed the hospital. Many of them lived in dormitories located above the wards. Red Cross workers also helped staff the hospital and tried to make the children feel at home with treats and gifts, which for the poorest children was the stuff of dreams. This year distributed about a thousand toys, 500 picture books, 500 sticks of candy, 500 cakes of chocolate. Elizabeth Gardner, Red Cross social worker, Miss Hannah, she was so good. She was a nurse that you can dream about. She'd always bring me a present from New York City when she'd come. I had a doll and I had some leather gloves. The ladies in white, we used to call them. They were very nice. I mean, they talked to the children, they stroked their hair, and they touched their cheeks and held our hands. They were nice. Medical treatment at the hospital was as advanced as anywhere in the world. The newest antiseptic techniques governed the hospital's operating rooms. Doctors and nurses wore rubber gloves, used only sterilized instruments, and applied only disinfected dressings. A fresh can of ether for each operation was mandated, and a nurse maintained an exact count of the antiseptic sponges inserted and removed from the patient during surgery. A rare variety of diseases is seen. Rare tropical diseases, unusual internal disorders, strange skin lesions. Dr. Alfred Reed. Patients with pneumonia, whooping cough, and measles were housed in one ward. Those with scarlet fever, diphtheria, mumps, and chickenpox in a second. Another ward was reserved for the fungal disease Favus, which causes the scalp to crust over, leading to baldness. There were two wards each for trachoma and venereal disease. Two wards were also set aside for tuberculosis, whose patients were instructed to receive as much fresh air as possible at all times, a harsh treatment in winter. Not all of the patients in the hospital were immigrants. 19-year-old Orman Joseph McDermott was a visitor to America. His initial act of forgetfulness, leaving his passport on board ship, coupled with his questionable employment status, 
led to his detention on Ellis Island. For nine days, the young salesman waited in crowded dormitories as authorities sought to verify his position as a sales apprentice rather than a contract laborer. During his detention, McDermott developed the telltale red rash of scarlet fever. When he was admitted to the Contagious Disease Hospital on February 25, 1921, his temperature was 105 degrees, and his heart was beating 150 times a minute. McDermott's medical record, one of the few left from the hospital archives, shows the limits of early 20th century medicine. Lucy Simpson, his public health nurse, could do little more than comfort him with aspirin and swab his throat with antiseptic. Patient in mild delirium all day has to be watched closely. Condition very poor, pulse weak. The pain and suffering that he must have gone through, a young man, 19, so far from home, so far from his family, all alone in a strange country, and so very, very sick, it broke my heart. Patient's mind is wandering. He's restless and wants to see his friend. Heart rate rapid, rash is spreading, given digitalis and camphor oil. Died March 2nd, 1225 AM. It's a retrospective diagnosis, but what I suspect happened is that the strep, which were still in his body, there were no antibiotics to wipe it out, had secreted this toxin. It circulated. He probably developed either pneumonia and or heart disease. He couldn't breathe very well, and he died. This was not, sadly, this was not an uncommon result of scarlet fever back then. Ellis Island was a place of great happiness and great sorrow. The coming together of families that had been separated for years was marvelous to see. Unfortunately, time did occur when a family had to be separated because of deportation or death. Then, then you wish you were somewhere else. In 1909, President William Howard Taft persuaded William Williams, a fellow Yale man, to return to Ellis Island for a second term as commissioner. The previous commissioner, Robert Watchhorn, a former immigrant, had overseen the arrival of a record number of newcomers. William Williams vowed to tighten the standards for entry. When immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe began to outnumber those from Northern Europe, more restrictions, aimed mainly at Jews, Slavs, and Italians, were imposed. Many members of Congress endorsed the theory of eugenics, claiming that the American gene pool was being weakened by the newcomers. In congressional testimony, William Williams argued for expanding the list of medical exclusions. It is the duty of the officers of the Public Health Service at Ellis Island to safeguard the country against the admission of these lumps of poisonous leaven. William Williams, Ellis Island Commissioner of Immigration. The testing for mental illness was where assumptions about the immigrants merged with the limits of medical knowledge to form an ugly chapter in the hospital's history. Federal law prohibited the admission of the feeble-minded, a term that applied to a wide array of symptoms. Thousands of hopeful arrivals, mostly of Southern and Eastern European origin, were diagnosed as mentally unfit and denied entry. 
These types of mental exams were, were promoted by the political elite and the, a, a particular strand of the scientific medical community that had become very concerned that immigrants from these Eastern European countries were simply inferior physically and genetically to what they called Native Americans. There was a great deal of nativism in the United States, uh, a great deal of anti-immigrant feeling, and one of the charges that uh, nativists often made was that immigrants were of an inferior emotional and mental stock. They were enfeebled and bringing their enfeeblement to the United States. Facial expression is a very valuable aid. Individuals possessing dull, stupid, indifferent, and apathetic countenances devoid of expression should be investigated more thoroughly for feeble-mindedness. Dr. Howard Knox. Feeble-minded, imbecile, uh, insane, uh, idiot. Um, these were operative terms at the time uh, in a, uh, a rudimentary science that was trying to distinguish uh, between normal and abnormal and various levels of abnormality. But to uh, develop diagnostic criteria and say this is this type of mental defect and this is that type based on a facial characteristic strikes me as a as an early science trying to find its footing. Questionable mental health practices continued. Hospital records include a request for one set of anthropometric instruments consisting of three metal calipers, which were used to measure the circumference of immigrants' heads. And they made uh, extensive notations by race and ethnic background. And uh, this was uh, something that had that interested the Immigration Service and interested Congress at a great, uh, great level because they did think, you know, they began to wonder, what is the future of America? What will happen to this country? My aunt was coming here, hopefully, to live here forever. She told my parents and her husband that when it came her turn to be questioned, they asked her, how many feet does a horse have? And she thought he was making a fool of her, that that was a stupid question. And she was detained on Ellis Island. I always suffered greatly when I was assigned to interpret for mental cases in the Ellis Island Hospital. Many of those classified as mental cases were so classified because of ignorance on the part of the immigrants or doctors and the inability of the doctors to understand the particular immigrant's norm or standard. Fiorella LaGuardia, Ellis Island interpreter. Two decades after opening, the hospital on Ellis Island was in decline not because the facility was outmoded, but because America was closing its borders to immigrants of the kind the hospital served. The hospital complex retained some signs of life. The FBI had an office there in the 1930s. During World War II, disabled American servicemen were housed there, as were some German and Italian prisoners of war. In 1954, however, the complex's last occupant, the U.S. Coast Guard, shut down operations, and the complex was left to ruin. At the Ellis Island Hospital, thousands died, hundreds were born, and tens of thousands gained the health they needed to enter America. The hospital was a place where America's ideals were tested, and a new policy called public health was implemented. No major epidemic can be traced to an immigrant who entered America after treatment in the hospital. The Ellis Island Hospital was not immune from restrictionist fever. The eugenics program is proof of that. Yet nine of every 10 patients held at the hospital were cured and were freed to become citizens. 
For them, it would always be a special place. And so when we think of Ellis Island as this monument to the masses, we might take a look at those hospitals, we might revisit those hospitals, uh, and see them as part of this monument, as part of this tribute uh, to all those who came to this country, who brought their efforts and their energies and their talents and, uh, and their culture and contributed to our society. Not all of them passed through the process easily. Many of them ended up in the hospital on Ellis Island. And so for them, their first taste of American life and their first experience with Americans was the experience of care and compassion. To those who went through it, it was one of the most precious gifts that they were ever given. Because when you were sick, you can't do anything about it. But here was a place that rescued you, that made you feel good that you were still being cared for, and in a strange place, thousands of miles away. So people can never say that, uh, that America isn't a place of compassion and understanding, because they certainly proved it there.